Before joining the Mosquitoes, John Wayne had starred in a number of series westerns from underground pictures, one of the studios that would merge to form Republic, and had continued with the studio after the change. The success of these movies had led him to do an action-adventure series for Universal, and a special, Born to the West, for Paramount. Returning to Republic for the Mosquitoes was a relative step down, but Wayne had made the best of it. Released in 1938, Overland Stage Raiders was the second of the series to star Wayne. It starts off with a bang as we see a series of robberies being committed in a brisk montage. Of course, being a Mosquitoes film, it's buses instead of trains or stagecoaches being robbed. We then cut to Tuscan and Lullaby, who are met by an excited Stoney who parachutes out of a plane to inform them of an impending robbery. We just spotted the Aura Grande Gold stage. It's about to be held up. Where? Kent's Pass. Kent's Pass. The trio chase the gang away and are heartily thanked by the Overland stage's owner, who offers them a job escorting the shipments. Stoney has a better idea, however. Better idea than that. Instead of shipping the gold out by bus, why don't you let Ned Hoyt fly it out? Ned Hoyt? You mean? Having recently purchased the Hoyt's airline, he works out a deal where the overland cargo and passengers will be flown instead of driven. This is much to the chagrin of Gordon Hart's Mullins, who is secretly behind the robberies and wants the shipping contract for himself, and much to the delight of Beth Hoyt, Stoney's girl, who desperately needs the business for her and her brother's airline. airline you over. can get away with it. It's your one chance to come back. Okay, sis. They can't kill you for trying. Hey, Lullaby. Wake up. It's time to go to sleep. Max Tarun, who had, by this point, played Lullaby in 17 movies, brought a more explicitly comedic quality to the role originally played by Sid Saylor. Having befriended Gene Autry at the National Barn Dance Radio Program in 1932, Tarun came to work for Republic Pictures through Autry's influence. A former vaudeville actor, he was known for his whistling routines, magic tricks, and ventriloquism. His ventriloquist dummy, Elmer, first introduced alongside Tarun in Ghost Town Gold, is a real hoot in this film. Say, Elmer, did you ever fly incognito? Incognito? Where in the heck is that? Flew all over Kalamazoo. Louise Brooks, now an icon of the flapper era, plays Beth Hoyt in this film. Having become something of a sex symbol in Europe during the silent era, the actress was now regulated to low-paying jobs in poverty roll films. There was simply no place for her in the sanitized Hollywood of the late 1930s. Nevertheless, her performance is actually pretty decent as far as these things go, and she's a more nuanced character than most of the love interest in these old B-Westerns. I talked him out of it. I was afraid he would spoil his chance. And then that day on the trail, I, I tried to explain, but... Never mind. You run along and try not to worry. We've got a plan all figured out. Thanks, Tony. This film was directed by George Sherman, who helmed all eight of the Mosquitoes films with Wayne, and quite a few of the series entries before and after Wayne's tenure. Like Wayne, Sherman would go on to bigger and better things later on, directing many of the actors' A pictures for Republic in the 1940s. He was one of Republic's top talents, and does a great job with the action in particular. Indeed, the season with Wayne represents the height of the series in terms of consistent quality, despite the fact that Wayne lacked the same dynamic with Corrigan that Livingston had had. All right, Brain Trust, suppose you tell me how you're going to work all these miracles. You heard me, we're half owners in the airline. And what are we going to use for money? Corral dust? Keep your wig on, Grandpa. I'll tell you all about it later. Right now, I have more important business. 